Welcome to Bay Path College. Are you glad to be back? Let's do a round of applause for our alumni that are back. I love it. Kathy said we had to start on time. I hated to stop the chatter because half of the reason we all get together is right to network, catch up, and enjoy each other. But I'm just thrilled that the Alumni Association who planned this event selected a topic that I think all of us can learn from. See, that's networking right there, hugging, <laughs> shaking hands. And I have to tell you, for all of you that I've had an opportunity to say hello to, and, and we certainly will have some, a few moments after our event tonight, um, it's been great to see some of you come back. We have students here from 1970, 82, uh, a few of you from the class of 2012. Who's here from the class of 2012? Let's give them a round of applause. I have to tell you, they had the most spectacular commencement at the Mass Mutual Center. For those of you from 1970 and 1982, you were probably here when this college was maybe 400 students, 500 students. We had 574 graduates participate, 712 who actually received a diploma. Because we have many of our students online now. So I'm so proud of our class of 2012. I'm proud of all of you. But it was a great event and we had Katie Coleman, Colonel, retired Colonel, Katie Coleman who's an astronaut and she showed pictures where she spent 159 days in space last year one of a few women astronauts. So I think our students were in outer space during the ceremony, but they certainly were learning from an incredible woman scientist. But I wanted to just give you a few updates. How many of you realize that Bay Path College just received our provisional accreditation to offer a Master's of Science in Physician Assistant Studies? How many of you knew this? Well, if you didn't, we are on the move and we recruited 24 students like that because physician assistants today earn approximately $100,000 on average when they graduate with a two-year master's degree. It is like starting a medical school and for those of you who haven't been in car in a long time, just venture down to the lower level someday and you will see 10 examining rooms just like you would see at Bay State Medical or Mercy Medical Center. It is incredible to think that we have medical doctors on our faculty now, physician assistants. It is a really wonderful program to offer for this region and we're very community oriented. So many of our students will be in the clinics in the inner city and will be certainly around the Connecticut and Massachusetts areas. So we're thrilled about our PA program. We'll start a major in September in neuroscience at the bachelor's level. Can you believe that? We've recruited a neuroscientist from Delaware. Her husband, ironically, happened to be a biochemist. We said, come on, we'll hire you too. Um, Dr. Melissa Morris Olson put together the feasibility study, and this program will be extraordinary. One of the fastest growing areas of science, many women, right? science and psychology, the biology, psychology and chemistry fields all coming together. And so we are very thrilled to have this extraordinary program. But here's an interesting component and I give uh, Dr. Princey Manila and Dr. Melissa Morris Olson credit for this. We have put together a collaboration with UMass Amherst Master's Program in Neuroscience so that our students in their junior and senior year summers will do research at UMass, they'll stay four years with us, and then they'll slide right into the Masters of Science in Neuroscience at UMass. So it's incredible. And let me just share a, a few of the success stories of our graduates. I know you are all successful, but the students who just graduated from the traditional program who are going on to graduate programs, one case in point, Vanessa Chaplin, who happened to receive the Eagle Award from Dr. Enzo Di Giacomo and Mary Louise Di Giacomo this graduation. She was a forensic science and biology major. 
She is going to be in the PhD program at UMass Amherst in chemistry, one of only 25 from around the world who were selected for this PhD program, fully paid $23,000 a year in stipend. She will teach, but here's the most incredible part of it all. Only nine Americans out of the 25 students, and Vanessa Chaplin is one. Another student who worked three jobs, one of which she was a waitress at the, at the uh, country club here in Longmeadow. She was a biotech major and, sh and a forensic science major. She's going to be at UConn's program in words that I can't even tell you. No, she's going to be in a DNA genetic biology program with bioinformatics as sort of her minor and she was accepted in this master's program. So it's a very exciting time for me, obviously, and for the staff and faculty to see where our students are going with their Bay Path education. But the most important message about your alma mater is it is moving, it is growing, it is very innovative. And now we have 2,300 students around the world. We have the three campuses, but we also have students now taking our online programs around the world. And for those of you who have an aunt or a niece or someone who never completed their education and can't come to a college campus, the online completer program is the place for them because they will be able to do their last 60 credits at Bay Path's online completer program. It is a fabulous model. We have faculty who are called educator coaches, and they not only teach, but they coach and mentor the students through all of their courses so that at the end of their education, they have had content, but they've also had career advice all along the way. I've said to Melissa, the next thing we have to do at Bay Path is a bachelor's degree from freshman year for adult women all the way through the senior year. So know that when you read about the MIT and Harvard connection for this EDX online program that they have modeled together, higher ed is going to change drastically and I'm going to predict it's going to be very different in the next five years. And Bay Path has positioned itself very fortunately with a wonderful program exclusively for women and we're only one of about 50 colleges in the whole country that can offer an exclusive program for women at the baccalaureate level online. So a distinctive niche that we're going to milk for everything we can. <laughs> know it. We love being bold at Bay Path College. I'm going to share one more thing about bold. I love the word bold. And someone said to me, well, what does bold mean to you? And I said, for me, bold means stepping out of your comfort zone and taking a risk, doing something you've never done before. Bold is a woman like you who will come to a session like this and say, you know, I'm still learning and I need to learn. We have a campaign at Bay Path called the Bold Women Campaign. And it's all about trying to help our students be bold women. So if you are able, and if you believe you are bold, or you have a person you want to honor, a mother, an aunt, a faculty member that really changed your life, I want you to pick up this, the world needs more bold women brochure. Look at it, think about it, and I hope you'll join us in the Bold Women campaign. It's our 115th anniversary. Jill, where are you, Jill Munson? Where, where's Jill? Jill's back there. And if you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, Bay Path is going to be honored in September for our 115th anniversary. So all we need is 115 bold women who say, I will contribute to a scholarship for Bay Path College. So I hope that you'll be at the Chamber breakfast I hope you'll consider joining us and being a bold woman. Now let me just share with you my own personal philosophy about networking because you're in for a treat when you meet Karen. And I've known her for years, probably as long as I've been at Bay Path. And when you put the two of us together, both of us being extreme extroverts, um, you will learn so much from this woman. But I wanted to share with you just a few comments 
about my own personal feelings about networking because I think it really is an art and, an, and a science. It's an opportunity for you to reach out to somebody that you don't know. So I'm going to ask this one question. How many of you are sitting at a table with people that you do not know? <laughs> this is good. Now, how many of you have collected your first business card tonight? Good. This, these, these are women who know how to network. So I would say approximately 20% of you have received one business card tonight. By the time you leave, I'm hoping that each of you have at least 10 business cards in your pocket. Because it may not be the person's business card that you get tonight, but it may be just one comment from this individual that will lead you to a new job. And I'll just give you an example. I just met somebody who graduated and was talking to that individual. And within five minutes, I had already made a contact for this person. And I'm hoping that that contact will lead to a new job. So it was somebody I have never talked to before, but just through the few words that they said to me, I was able to make an instant connection, and now I hope that that individual follows through. So it's an art and a science, and I want you to know why. It's an art and a science because some of it is instinct and some of it's learned. And hopefully tonight you're going to learn a few new tips of, about networking and achieving success in your careers. What else do I believe about networking? It truly works. And why does it work? Because networking is all about trying to get something that will help you. And through that, hopefully you'll be able to help somebody else. So I'm going to give you a real life example. And it has nothing to do with networking for a job. But it has to do with how we got Lady Margaret Thatcher, the first woman prime minister of Great Britain, to come to Bay Path College. Does anybody know that story? OK, nobody knows it. Women's Conference, 1996, Elizabeth Dole. She has an advanced person. I don't know this advanced person, young, nice looking man, so I just sort of straddled next to him for the rest of the conference. <laughs> We're talking. He said, who else would you like to have come to your conference or your college? He said, I said, you know, the person I really would love is Lady Margaret Thatcher because she might not have been popular in her country, but she saved it from economic disaster. So he said, well, my mother is the advanced person in the United States to Lady Margaret Thatcher. Now, what are the chances of that happening? So I said, oh, I said, I will take her any month, any day of the year. We'll build the program around her, not around us. So he said, I'll call my mother. Her mo his mother's name was Anne. Three weeks later, I get a phone call. Can you be in Alexandria, Virginia in, in two days? I said, yes, and I'll bring Karen Hoban with me. We went to Alexandria, Virginia. We met Lady Thatcher. We signed a contract, and she came in 1998, June of 98. The story gets better. She brings three police officers from Scotland Yard with her. And here's a part of networking you must remember. Be nice to any person you meet, no matter what state of life they're from, no matter what they look like, just be nice. These three police officers, I hit it off with two. Two stayed in our home. And I thought they were policemen. In a year, I'm in England, so I decide I'm going to call. He had given me his card. I called Bob Milton. I said, Bob, Noel, and I are going to be in England. He said, oh, what would you like to do? And I said, well, we've done Westminster and Big Ben and all of that. He said, well, come to lunch at Scotland Yard. I didn't realize he was in charge of all security for diplomats from countries around the world to Great Britain. He was, he was in charge of all security for members of parliament. That's why, Lady Thatcher. So he said, I've got the best thing I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you a private tour of 10 Downing Street. How many people get into 10 Downing Street? I walk into 10 Downing Street, and guess who I meet? Tony Blair in his 1,000th day. And he signed a book, and he shook my hand, and I said to myself, 
he is a good looking guy. <laughs> no, I did. I, I, I said to myself, can you imagine from meeting that advanced person to his mother, to Lady Thatcher, to the police officer, to Tony Blair, when I walked back to the hotel, my friend said to me, so what did you do today? And I said, I went to 10 Downing Street and I met the Prime Minister. They said, you've been here for 48 hours and you've met the Prime Minister of Great Britain. So networking isn't just about jobs. Networking is about life and experiences and, and capturing something that you probably can't even conceive of. I asked Karen if she was going to talk about being an introvert or an extrovert and how that plays into networking. Because sometimes it may be hard for an introvert to walk up to someone they don't know in a big business meeting and say, hi, how are you? You know, it might be very difficult. So I've asked her to talk about that because you can be an introvert and an extrovert and still be successful in networking. And finally, I'm going to read a quote from a, an author, and I've, I've used this book on social capital many times, and the author is Wayne Baker, and his book is Achieving Success Through Social Capital. What I just talked to you about is social capital, having knowledge of somebody, knowing somebody. You don't have to have a lot of money, but if you have social capital, you have something very valuable. And here's what he said. He said, it's more, than what, it's more than what you know, it's who you know who will help you to produce higher wages for yourself, more promotions, better jobs, and new business opportunities. And I would add, life's treasures. So let me introduce, now that you've heard a few of my networking stories, let me introduce a woman that I think is an extraordinary example of somebody who knows how to work a room. Karen Zinter is an experienced educator and she's been working in our online program as one of our educator coaches, but she's been in the field of education for nearly two decades. She is not only an educator coach at Baypath, but she is teaching in, as a senior lecturer in management at Western New England University. These are some of the things I didn't know about Karen, so I, I thought I'd share it. She's the chief operating officer at the Daily Dot, the hometown newspaper of the World Wide Web. So we're going to have to ask her what that really means. She recently completed the University of Pennsylvania's world-renowned graduate program in applied positive psychology. And when you meet her, she is certainly a woman who has a positive attitude on life. You'll have the opportunity to learn a bit more about how she uses positive psychology and how we will be able to apply it to networking in just a few minutes. But to keep things really interesting, here's what else she does. She is the co-owner and a beekeeper at C&C Orchards. And how many of you ever heard of C&C Orchards? Karen, I had never even known about C&C Orchards, but it's a small apiary that specializes in supplying raw, local honey to restaurants and pastry chefs. And here's a medical fact. For those of you who have allergies, right? Honey from your local community will help you fight your allergies. Am I right, Karen? Okay. But she not only does all of that, but she has been studying martial arts and training for ultra marathons. You have to tell me what an ultra marathon is. Longer than 26, I, I thought you were going to say 0 0.2. For me, it's 0 .2, 0 0.2 miles. But she's going to complete a 100-mile race, and she'll be able to check that off her bucket list. Join me in welcoming an extraordinary woman and a bold woman, Karen Zinter. Thank you, Dr. Leary, and thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, after Dr. Leary's stories about networking, well, I think we're done here. <laughs> I'm not sure I can match some of those stories, but give me a few months. I'll see what I can do. I always love when I'm asked to come and speak about networking, mostly because for those of you who have now met me, 
I'm, I'm a people person, what can I say? Uh, but a lot of times I, I always wonder when I get that initial phone call or email inquiry saying, well, will you come and speak to our group about networking? I think, well, why? You know, what makes me better than somebody else or more well qualified to speak about networking than somebody else uh, in the area might be? And, and then I think to myself, well, I've, I've got sort of a list of rules that I like to follow. And I don't always follow them perfectly. But I try to, and I'm hoping that by sharing some of these rules and ideas with you, you can take them home and start to apply them in your opportunities for networking. To start with, I want to share with you an idea that comes from one of my favorite business books. And for those of you who were in the MBA program here and are alums or are currently in the MBA program, I suspect many of you have read uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. How many people have read Good to Great? Oh, excellent. You guys are near and dear to my heart as a result of that. But you know from that book that many great companies, the only thing that makes them different than the good companies is that they've done little things exceptionally well. And in my experience, being a great networker is about doing little things exceptionally well. So to think about positioning yourself as a networker, first of all, recognize that great networkers always have a plan. They have a plan on how they want to build their business, how they want to move it forward, how they're going to communicate effectively, and how they're going to position themselves as an expert. As a result of having this plan and this outlook, people are naturally drawn to them because they recognize somebody who's thought through what they want to accomplish in life. And they acknowledge that that's somebody who's doing little things exceptionally well. So the first thing to think about is what's your networking plan? And it's interesting that Dr. Leary brought up the idea of social capital because networking really is all about building social capital. Now, if you aren't really sure what social capital means, it's simply the resources that are available to you through your business and through your personal networks. So here's a place where professional and personal overlap because both those personal networks and those professional networks help to provide you with very valuable social capital. Now it's interesting because you might think, okay, but how do I go about building these relationships, building this social capital, especially if I'm an introvert? Well, let me share with you a little story that some of you may find hard to believe, but I assure you it is absolutely truthful. I used to be shy. <laughs> no, really, seriously. I'm talking not just a little shy. I mean social anxiety disorder kind of shy. I literally couldn't be around other people most notably when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> so I, uh, I grew up in the Midwest, small town, went to a very small public school with half-day kindergarten. No joke, in the three hours that I was at kindergarten each day, I cried. Didn't matter, there was something for me to cry about. Maybe it was because the kid handing out the scissors gave me a left-handed scissors instead of a right-handed scissors. Maybe it was because I couldn't get my rug out of the cubby hole during nap time. Maybe it was because we were having chocolate milk for snack and I really wanted white milk. It didn't matter, I would cry about it. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I actually made it through an entire half day of kindergarten without crying. Mrs. Hauk, my beloved kindergarten teacher, 
being very proud of this day, wrote a note that said, I didn't cry in kindergarten today, and pinned it to me when I got on the bus to go home. <laughs> Therapy. Years of it. Just kidding. I did eventually get over that somewhere around middle school, oddly enough, and realized that it was actually a whole lot more fun to be the center of attention than to be the kid that sat in the corner and cried. Not really sure where that epiphany came from, might have been all of the public speaking contests that my mom decided to sign me up for. <laughs> Imagine your eight-year-old, incredibly shy, horrified of other people's and saying, hey honey, you're going to be in a public speaking contest. Great, now I've got my kindergarten teacher and my mom trying to scar me for life. What can you say? But the great thing is that I've actually learned that this whole idea of being able to connect with other people and to build social capital and to build these relationships is actually deeply rooted in our psychology and actually in the positive side of psychology. Now, you might think, like, positive psychology? What is that? So for anybody who's studied a little bit of psychology or read a lot of self-help books, you'll notice that the field of psychology, the way we generally perceive it, tends to be focused on things that are wrong with us, the ways in which we're broken. And I don't know, it just never really worked for me. I don't like to think of myself as broken. I like to think of myself as pretty awesome. And so when I discovered that there's actually a whole segment of psychology where the focus is on how do we take all of the things that are really great about people or how do we take all of the things that are not broken and make them better, I realized that I really needed to spend a year just studying positive psychology. And one of the best theories that I learned about is a theory called the broaden and build theory. The broaden and build theory states that positive emotion is part of our experience for a reason. Now, if you think about negative emotion, fear, anger, makes sense that humans would evolve to have negative emotion. It protects us from things. It keeps us from getting hurt, whether physically or emotionally. But it's a little bit more challenging to figure out why we feel positive emotion, why feel joy, why feel happiness, why feel serenity. Well, it's actually all about the idea of being able to broaden our outlook on things. So positive emotion helps us to expand the way we see the world. When we expand the way we see the world, we're more open to building our social capital. So, Interestingly enough, you've probably noticed if you came in tonight and you were in a good mood and excited to be here, which I'm sure you all were, it's much easier to walk up and talk to a stranger than if you are not in a great mood for some reason. You know, maybe you had a bad day at work or you know, maybe something unhappy had happened, you know, you got some, some unfortunate news and you came and you were just kind of bummed out. It's a lot harder to approach a random individual and say, hi, I'm Karin, when you're not feeling happy. So interestingly enough, you can use the idea of positive psychology and this idea of positive emotion and apply it to your building of social capital. So recognize that when you make your plan for networking, you will always be a better networker when you're in a good mood. So if you're thinking about going out to a networking event and these things make you a little bit nervous or uncomfortable or you're less than thrilled about it, find some way to channel some positive emotion. Listen to some great music in the car. That's what I did on the way here. It was a little dance party with Karin. It was great. Uh, you know, or Whatever it is, you know, call a friend, somebody who's very upbeat, watch a funny video on YouTube, read something inspiring, a quote or a short story, something that will put you in a positive frame of mind. That way, when you walk into that less than uh, fabulous environment, you know, something that makes you a little bit nervous, your positive emotion will help you be more open to the experience of meeting strangers. And this is really very important. If you recognize that you're just having a 
truly bad day, the type of bad day that you can't fix, you can't channel that positive emotion from somewhere, recognize it's going to hinder your ability to successfully network. And that does not necessarily mean walk away from the networking opportunity, but know that it's a more challenging mental state to be in to network than if you're in a positive mood. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing and something that you can think about how to apply it in your own life, in your own networking experience. How do I get to my happy place so that when I walk into a room full of strangers, I, I can't wait to meet them versus how long do I need to stand in the corner before I can leave? So let's move on to a few other ideas about how you can use positive emotion and positive attitude to help you in your networking. So positive emotion is contagious. You've probably noticed that. You probably have that friend who you like to do your smile and you're like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. You have that friend that you call when you need you know, somebody to really give you a pick-me-up because that person is always positive and in this, the minute you hear their voice, you start to talk to them, their positive attitude, their positive emotion starts to fuel your positive emotion. Emotions work in a really interesting sort of spiral-like fashion. So positive emotion feeds positive emotion in an upward spiral. Of course, on the flip side, negative emotion feeds negative emotion in the downward spiral. So you can actually use that by tapping a positive person to go with you to a networking event, or look for the most positive person in the room and talk to them first. Because that person will infuse you with their contagious positive energy and make you more apt to want to go and build your social capital throughout. Some other things to think about when you're setting your goals for networking is that if you don't have a goal, you're going to lack motivation to actually get to an end point as part of your experience. How many people in here are goal setters? Huh, surprise, surprise, like 95% of you. Uh, how many people in here uh, set a New Year's resolution this year? Ooh, now why did the, no I've got a room full of goal setters, but not New Year's resolution setters. What's that all about? Yeah, okay, I think you're much like me. You think, all right, New Year's resolution is some acknowledgement that there is something wrong with me. There is nothing wrong with me. I am quite fine just the way I am, thank you very much. Goal setting is a very different mindset. Goal setting is, I am here, and this is where I want to end up. It's not that here is bad, it's just that over here is a little bit better, and wow, that would be cool. So set your goal so that you have motivation to actually achieve it. Now you might think, networking goal? What, what's a networking goal? How do I tally when I've been a successful networker? How many of you collected a business card already? Yeah, that's a good tally. Now, of course, there is the, I collected a bunch of cards, and then there is, I made meaningful connections with people. Let's be clear about the two. So think about how many meaningful connections you'd like to make at a given event, in a given day, in a given week, in a given month, in a given year. Now, for those of you who think, well, that's easy for you, Karin. You're like extroverted and outgoing and you like meeting people and you know, you got over your shy issues. I'm not there yet. You don't need to set a huge goal, one person a day. If that seems too daunting, one new person a week. And you can meet people anywhere. Don't think, well, you know, gee, this is the first time Baypath has had a networking event. I'm going to have to wait a whole other year to do this again, potentially. <laughs> no, I got to tell you, there are really fabulous people to meet standing in the checkout line at Big Y. Ask me how I know. Yeah, okay, what can I say? I talk to everybody everywhere. I take every opportunity I can. Now, of course, it helps if the other person is somewhat receptive. Otherwise, they just look at me like I'm slightly crazy. But start small. It's easy. Smile and say hello. How nice is it when somebody actually acknowledges that you're in the same physical space as they are? And that's all you need to do. And for some of you, 
That even might seem like a big step. You want me to smile at a stranger? Yes, yes I do. That is what I'm suggesting. But take the opportunity to smile. That's positive energy, it's positive emotion, it's contagious. Chances are when you smile at somebody, they will smile back. Ooh, that's a good starting point. Now say hello. Chances are most of, us, most of us have been raised in polite society to then respond with a hello in kind. It may stop there. That's okay. That's a good starting point if that's all the more you can manage as you're getting started in your networking. For those of you that are ready for the advanced class, now actually launch into conversation. Now you might think, uh, <laughs> uh, like what? Pick something. Pick an interesting topic. Now, of course, you can always default to the weather. Because <laughs> here in New England, if we wait five minutes, it'll change. <laughs> so that's great. You might say, oh, that's really kind of a lame topic. Like, how am I supposed to network with somebody by talking about the weather? It doesn't really matter what you start with. But the idea of, as Dr. Leary pointed out, be nice is quite useful. So it might be something as, that's a very interesting pin that you're wearing tonight, Kelly. I like that. Where did you get that? I got it right out here at the check-in Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, so whatever the case might be, you can start conversations very, very easily. Now, obviously, not everybody is going to become your new best friend. That's okay. That's not necessarily your goal. You're trying to build meaningful relationships. If people are less than receptive, move on. If they're really meant to be part of your social capital in the long run, at some point they will come back into your sphere and that's totally fine. If not, move on to the next person. So think about how you can start those small conversations and build them into more meaningful conversations. Ask people questions. People love to talk about themselves. Most of us are exceptionally self-centered in that regard. It's great. But if you ask someone questions about themselves, first of all, they're more comfortable and confident answering those questions than asking them something deep and philosophical right off the bat. So start with something easy. You know, where do you live? Where do you work? What do you do? Do you like it there? How long have you been there? Now, I already met probably a dozen or more people this evening, and most of you probably recognize that that was sort of my string of questioning, was trying to understand a little bit more, not just about your title, but a little bit about how long maybe you've been in your job, and do you enjoy it, and do you envision yourself being there for the long term? Or are you looking to do something else? Now, it's great because people say, oh, OK, great. I get to talk about myself. It's nice. It's very easy. It's a safe, comfortable, a safe, comfortable topic for most people. But it also gives me a little bit of an insight as to what are you like as a person, you know, the type of place that you work and the type of work that you do, and whether you enjoy it, that's really helpful. It helps me to understand a little bit more about you and also to think about how I might ultimately be able to help you in some way. Perhaps you have a job opening and you're looking to hire somebody and I know somebody with a, a skill set that matches that particular job opening. Or perhaps you're looking to move on to a different job and I happen to know some place that has a job opening that you might be a good fit for. Or any number of interesting and creative things. So, Dr. Leary mentioned that networking is not just about finding a job, so let me tell you my most interesting networking story that's not professionally related. Some years ago, uh, I was quite actively racing mountain bikes in my spare time uh, because I've always liked to pursue very strange athletic endeavors. Uh, but after my orthopedic surgeon put me back together one too many times, he suggested that I pursue a slightly tamer sport. I decided I would take up triathlon. Seemed like a really good idea at the time. He didn't necessarily agree, but you know, we didn't see eye to eye in very many things. So of course, I began to announce to everybody who would listen to me that I was going to do a triathlon the next season. Now, of course, uh, most people, when I made this announcement, looked at me a little strangely. A few were bold enough to say, <laughs> that's nice, <laughs> which of course then just kind of 
fueled the fire and made me really determined to actually complete a triathlon. But in talking to one of my colleagues at the time, she said, really? I had no idea that you at all were interested in swimming and running. You know, I knew you had been a biker, but I had no idea you were interested in swimming and running. I too am a swimmer. And there is this really fantastic master swim team right down the street from where you live that practices Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings at 6 AM. You should think about joining them. So this is one of those moments when I thought, why is it that I tell people about my crazy dreams? Because then they suggest that I should actually take crazy steps to achieve them. Uh, but I thought, well, this is really kind of interesting. I, first of all, literally had no idea there was a master swim team three blocks away from me. Also didn't know that anybody would actually want to get in a pool at 6 AM. <laughs> Still haven't quite figured that part out. But it was like this great piece of information that ultimately through that exchange, I ended up joining this master swim team, met an incredible crew of triathletes, because most people who get up at that hour of the morning to get in a very cold pool in January in New England are intensely training for something. In this case, it was triathlon. So I joined this, this, this uh, team and swam with this group of triathletes and ended up ultimately racing triathlons for about the next eight years, all just because I suddenly had a group of people to support me and a network to support me that I didn't know existed previously. And it came out of simply passing a little piece of information and conversation about myself to somebody else. It wasn't something that I intended to happen. It was a casual conversation. And boom, I got connected to this incredible network of people who could support me. I will tell you, that shy thing, yeah, that came back the first day I showed up for the swim team, 6 AM, swimsuit, not a good look for anybody. And I suddenly was like, I don't know that I can do this. But you know, I'm one that as soon as I feel any sort of fear, I'm like, OK, now I got to take the bull by the horns and let's get this thing done. So networking can be a great way to connect you to not just professional goals, but also a lot of personal goals. Keep in mind as you move forward in your networking, as you set your goals and you work to achieve them, that a lot of people you will meet are actually very interested in helping you. Now, you, really? Seriously? Other, uh, yeah, guess what? Most people network not in order to help themselves, but to help other people. And you might wonder why is it that people would be so giving of themselves in this way? Let's go back to some positive psychology. So this interesting concept in positive psychology called the helper's high. How many people here have ever volunteered? How many people here volunteer regularly? How many people enjoy their volunteer work? Why? It's giving back. You get as much out of it as the organization that you're giving to or the individual that you're giving to. You know, you think about the old saying, it's better to give than to receive. And we usually think about that in the sense of Christmas gifts, you know. But it works the same way when you're networking. Most people network not so much to help themselves, but to help other people. Because they get what's called a helper's high. They actually enjoy being able to help somebody else in some way. It's a, it's a really incredible psychological impact that people have. And seeing other people succeed helps fuel their own positive emotion. So as I talk to people and make connections with them, I feel good. And when I feel good, it makes me want to go do more good things for other people. And many of you probably have recognized that in your volunteer work. View your networking as a way to do the same thing on a very individual, personal level for people. And think about how you can benefit from that helper's high. Ultimately, as you help other people along the way, all that good stuff will come back to you eventually, usually when you least expect it, but most need it, which is pretty awesome. It helps, of course, if you approach your networking from a place of sincerity. Being authentic is absolutely key to successful networking. Now, you can probably think of people that you've met 
and the conversation has been less than authentic. It's just felt fake. And you can tell that they're just passing time or trying to get something out of you. And they're trying to check a box for that day or that moment. And you walk away from the conversation usually feeling a little icky. We know that feeling, right? We don't like that, okay? We like to have that feeling of authenticity, that, that feeling of sincerity. So as you approach your conversations, think about having them come from a place that's really authentic for you. So I, for me, when I walk into a room like this, I look at all of the fabulous people who I have yet to meet. To me, that's like a giant treasure chest. What might I find tonight when I walk into this room? What might happen as I have conversations with people? Who might I meet that is interesting and unique and will in some way potentially change my life because I can share with them a particular piece of information or a connection or they share something with me, perhaps without even knowing it. So think about from a very authentic sort of centered place how it is you want to approach your networking and how it is you can actually build those connections in a way that feels very sincere and real. People spot insincerity a mile away and they will steer clear of you. And if you've had any sort of negative experience with networking and, and likely that has been part of that puzzle where you've just walked away saying there was nothing good there. It wasn't from a place of authenticity. Some ways to make sure that you actually are being authentic. So if you're sort of questioning, like, how do I know? How do I know when I'm doing it right? Am I just supposed to feel it? For most of us, that's the way it works. But a way to kind of double check is pay attention to how you're making eye contact with people. So think about it as you talk to somebody. If you're doing a lot of that. That's not being sincere. You're not really trying to engage with that person. You're not really trying to connect with that person. You're quite distracted by any number of other things. Now, that, of course, is the sort of old school version of the insincerity or the lack of connection. The new school version is, oh, let me pull out my smartphone <laughs> Well, we have this conversation, and let me pay attention to that instead of actually talking to and connecting with the live human in front of me. So think about and kind of gut check, am I making good eye contact with this person? Am I really focused on what it is they're saying? Am I fully engaged? Stop multitasking, essentially, which is really, really tough. Many of us are sort of trained now that that's how we're supposed to operate or function. In reality, most humans are really bad multitaskers. We're just not equipped for it on a, uh, truly on a brain level. And so stop doing it. It's not helpful for most of us. And so be very connected to the person you're talking to. Good eye contact and give them your undivided attention. As you make connections with people and you have those conversations, when you wrap them up, show your gratitude. Thank somebody for the conversation. Thank them for the opportunity to get to know them or to spend a few moments with them. We all love to be told thank you for doing something. And although we might take it for granted that, oh, well, we're at a networking event, of course people are going to talk to me. It's still nice to have somebody say, thank you, it was nice meeting you. Or thank you, I enjoyed this conversation. Or thank you, I'd love to talk to you again in the future. So practice gratitude as you're building your network. It goes a long way. And when people in your network have done something meaningful for you, helpful for you, be sure to thank them. A thank you by email, always nice. A thank you by phone, even better. A handwritten thank you note, now you're gonna get the big thumbs up. So when somebody has really actually gone above and beyond and helped you as part of your network, Say thank you. It's one of our most basic tenets that we've been taught since we were very, very young. But many of us take for granted our personal and professional connections and forget to take that moment to say thank you. I had a young woman today who actually asked me to connect her to some people in my professional network uh, as she was doing some job searching and investigating some organizational culture at, at different companies she might like to work in. 
And it was so great to just get an email from her saying, thank you so much you know, for taking the time. And, I, and I'm telling, I literally spent maybe five minutes sending a couple of quick emails like, hey, you know, so-and-so, I'd like you to meet so-and-so, and can you guys, you know, talk and do your thing, because I think she's a great fit for your organization, and here, go make this happen. Was not a lot of effort on my part, yet this email that she sent me was very effusive and really, you know, it was quite obvious that her gratitude was very deep for me taking the time to do that. So make sure that you take a few moments and you send that thank you email or you pick up the phone and make that call or when it's a really big deal, the handwritten tops it like nothing else. Well, we've only got a few minutes remaining, so I just want to give you a few other things to think about as you go into your different networking activities. Body language, huge. And since most networking is best done face to face, live and in person, the social networking, the online virtual networking is sort of a whole different category that we could get into, but I don't have the time for that tonight. So think about your body language. Now, obviously approaching somebody, making great eye contact, with the arms you know, not crossed, that kind of withdrawn like, oh my gosh, don't talk to me, um, is always a good way to think about approaching somebody in your body language. But recognize that you make that first impression within the first three seconds. So think about what your, and it's really your body language that's actually conveying that message in the first three seconds. It's, you haven't had a chance to say anything yet. So it's about your body language. And most notably, it's usually about your facial expression. You know, most of us are heavily dependent upon understanding somebody's mood or their attitude or what emotion they're feeling by looking at somebody's face. Eyes are incredibly expressive. So if you happen to be wearing sunglasses, and you're walking into an event, take them off first. It seems like such a small thing, but we tend to immediately shy away from people wearing sunglasses because we can't read their facial expression as well as we can when we can see their eyes. So keep that in mind. So make that first impression by having great body language. That's actually going to, even as you start to communicate with somebody, communicate 55% of your message. So your body language, if it trumps what you're actually saying, that's what people will pay attention to. And it's usually how people are reading that level of insincerity because your body language, your facial expression doesn't match your voice and your voice tone. The words you actually say carry very small amount of weight. So for those of you who feel that part of your concern or your shyness comes out of I don't know what to say, the actual words you say impact that relationship building or communicate your message a mere 7%. That's a tiny, tiny amount of the conversation. The other 38% is actually your voice tone. So if you're very monotone and uninteresting to listen to or talk to, then you're not going to get very far. You know, which obviously explains why I'm fairly animated and excited to be up here because even if you weren't hearing the words that I was saying, the body language and the voice tone communicates so much about the topic, which is really, woo, be enthusiastic, networking is awesome. I mean, that was really kind of all I had to say, right? So think about all of that as you go into networking situations. Now for those of you who are still feeling like, okay, this is all great, but I'm now about to walk into the event. I'm about to walk up to a stranger, and I just can't bring myself to do it. Give me the first crucial steps. Like, what do I say? What do I do? It's actually quite simple. Most people don't like networking. Most people, even when they're extroverted, get a little bit nervous about meeting a stranger. So there are plenty of times I walked in tonight and I didn't immediately see somebody that I knew. And I know a number of people here. So the fact that I walked in and was like, oh, I don't see any of my friends. What am I going to do? Even I have that immediate gut reaction of, what am I supposed to do? But I know how to override it. And I know that looking around the room, most other people probably feel some level of hesitation about approaching a stranger. 
And so I realized, you know what? I'm going to make somebody stay because I'm going to walk up to them and I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to be the one that takes the enormous risk. And that other person is probably going to go, oh, thank you. You just saved me. Now I don't have to take the risk. I get to just talk to you. You've already broken the ice. And so it's actually quite easy. I simply use the, hi, I'm Karin. Most people will respond in kind because we're well trained to then respond with a greeting and to say our name. Shaking hands is also kind of a, a bonus, so I'm a big fan of the put your hand out, shake somebody's hand. But really, once you've gotten there, you are 90% of the way into the conversation because the hardest part is that initial, let me cross the line, let me get over that really scary part of actually putting myself out there. But if you practice this, one thing you'll discover is that most times it goes pretty easily. It's momentarily uncomfortable, but once you're past that like, hi, I'm Karin phase, everything else just goes off without a hitch because most people are very happy to then engage in conversation. It's that initial fear of, I don't know you, I don't know what to do. Now remember, fear, negative emotion. What happens with negative emotion? We close down, we get a little tunnel vision, you know, we're trying to protect ourselves. So you have to, as a sentient human being, override that fear moment and say, no, channel my positive energy, let me use that to broaden and build and to build my social capital. So obviously there's tons of more great stuff that we could talk about when it comes to networking, but hopefully these strategies will help to get you started and get you excited and thinking about how you can go out and use all of these tools to build your relationships, whether they are professional, personal, or a combination of the two, build your social capital and go out and benefit from the helper's high of helping others who are part of your network. Uh, before I close this out, I want to point out to you that now that you are all incredibly inspired to build your networks, we do have some really great community organizations who have joined us this evening. And I have to say that, um, hi guys in the back, they're all my friends. Um, I, I got to say, I was really excited when I got here tonight and realized they were all here, mostly because I, I know the vast majority of the fine crew. And I was like, wow, I feel supported and loved, and that's pretty cool. So if you're looking for some great networking opportunities, please stop by and see the fine folks at the Professional Women's Chamber, which, you know, okay, full disclosure, I sit on their board of directors, so I'm a big fan, okay? Um, also, YPS, Young Professional Society here in Springfield, also BNI, Business Networking Incorporated, correct? I have that right? Okay, good, just making sure. Uh, and that's the BNI group based in Wilbraham, although there are a number of them in the area. And also we do have the fine folks that are here from the Career Services Office at Bay Path. Hi, you guys. So go back and talk to them as well. And please take advantage of these resources. These are great places that you can go and practice your newfound networking skills. Uh, I think the alumni associate, yes, Kathy, you're committing to a few more events? Yeah. Absolutely, see, there you go, absolutely. Kathy wants to support you in more networking opportunities as well. And obviously, if you have any questions about networking and you'd like to talk more with me, I will stay and answer your questions. But I wanna say thank you to all of you for coming. Go forth and network, but before you go forth and network, I think Carol's got a few last little words that she wants to say to wrap up. So thank you very much and have a fabulous evening. may have some questions that you have for, for Karen right now, and I hope you'll ask them. Totally. Totally, really. I can see there's one there, ooh, ooh, two, two there, and also we want to know from you, what do you want us to present next that will help you in your career success, your networking, your uh, search for maybe a new job, please let us know because then we will get someone like Karen to do that for the next session. Right, Kath? Yes. And there are evaluation forms and we do have some, wait a minute, where's the gift? Oh, this is the gift. 
We do have a gift for Karen. Oh, thank I you. I know it. And you did a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you. I mean, is she an extrovert, extreme extrovert? Okay, so no, some questions. Yes. Let Jane, me some I questions. know Jane has one first. I'm sorry, but first, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Can you remind me that elementary school and that home is really good. Absolutely. Okay, so let me address that. So the question is, you're, you're in a negative mood, you know, you know you've got this negative emotion, it's kind of closing you down, and yet you need to go into a networking event. So your option might be to walk away. Now, if you're going into a networking opportunity that's purely self-directed, self you know, you've opted in, that's great. But what happens when your boss has required you to be there? And this I see, you know, this often comes up for people when, you know, a lot of us work in environments where we have offices that might be across the country. We see our colleagues from these other offices maybe once a year at an annual meeting or at some uh, industry conference or function where we're required to be there. It's part of our job. And it's really tough in those environments to be like, well, I'm in a bad mood. I'm just going to, like, not participate, it's probably not going to go over well with the boss. And so those are the moments where you need to say, okay, let me first of all acknowledge that I'm feeling negative emotion. Because that makes it a whole lot easier to say, okay, this is hard, not because I'm bad at it. I mean, that's usually, as women, we're, that's our classic, well, I'm just bad at this. No, you're not bad at it. You're just in a bad mood. It makes it harder to do it. So finding ways, I have my personal team of cheerleaders. And I rely on them for these types of instances. So I literally have a list of about a half a dozen people who, when I am having a bad day or experiencing some kind of negative emotion, and I need a pick-me-up, they are on my speed dial, and I just get on the phone with one of them. And I got a handful of them because, you know, not everybody is available to me 24-7. I don't understand why not. But, you know, I know that there's a chance that I will be able to get one of them on the phone. And, and most of them know, like literally, you are one of my cheerleaders. They, they, they're actually just friends. Most of them are people who I've known professionally and I've just become friends with over time. And they tend, we actually tend to do it, it's a very reciprocal type of thing. We sort of acknowledge like, you are my cheerleader. So when I need you, when I need this, you're one of the people on my speed dial that I call. And you know, a lot of times I will just call, you know, call them and say, I, I need a little energy infusion. I need a little pick-me-up. And a lot of times just their general positive demeanor, uh, they'll have some quirky story about what's going on or just in talking to them, they can help to kind of turn that mood around for me um, at least enough so that I stop my downward spiral. And that's usually what I'm going for. Because then I can get my upward spiral typically going from that point. But I'm trying to stop that downward spiral, which is pretty crushing. So hopefully that's an idea that, that you can use as well. Sure. Okay, so a debate about do we volunteer for the helpers high or do we volunteer because we have a need for people to like us? That's interesting. I, I think that, you know, for a lot of us, sure, there may be an element of people like us as a result of that. But honestly, like if you think about that, that is really why do we want people to like us? It's part of building our social capital. It's part of building relationships with other people. And remember, if you really think about this from an evolutionary biology perspective, positive emotion and that idea of the helper's high or anything that fuels positive emotion, that comes from building social relationships 
because that's what we need. Like prehistoric man needed other humans to help keep them safe in many respects. So we're biologically programmed to build connections with other people. Unfortunately, the way that society is constructed today, we have a lot of opportunities to not do that. You know, we, we now tend to live in suburban areas. Heck, I live in Sunderland, so I, you know, I live in the woods. You know, I'm like, there are no humans around me. You know, but that's not, humans are hive creatures. You know, and if you think about in the animal world, there are only six species of hive creatures humans being one of them, bees actually being another one, so something I know a little bit about. Um, but really, if you think about it, that's how we best function together, even for those of us that are highly introverted and who need a lot of time just alone in order to be able to process and to, you know, exist. We don't, we're not programmed to be without other people. And so I would, I would really challenge that and say, yeah, I have a need to be liked by other people because I'm biologically programmed to build relationships with other humans. It's part of our genetic makeup. So, oh, ooh, I'm glad I can provide debate support. Okay, I saw a few other hands, so please, other questions. I would be happy to take them. Mercy, yes. Ooh, ooh, great question. Okay, so here's the thing. We have so many mechanisms now for staying in touch with other people. And this goes back to the idea of being authentic. Pick what works for you. Now, recognize that communication is a two-way street. So if you have realized that the person you're trying to build a relationship with is not a text person, don't text them, even though you might say like, but I love texting, texting is my preferred way to communicate. If I'm trying to build a relationship with you and I've discovered like, mm, Mercy's not really a texter, that's not her thing, then I need to modify my communication mechanism. So if I've discovered that you're really very prone to like answering emails and that's a great way for you to communicate, then that's what I should adopt in my relationship building with you. Even though it might not be my preferred way, I'm trying to build this relationship. Now, the great thing is that since it's a two-way street, hopefully with time, Mercy will then say, well, you know, I really prefer email, but I know Karen really likes to text, so I will try to reciprocate and modify my communication style as well to be more compatible in some ways. And that doesn't always happen. I see it sometimes more as a, um, a little bit in a generational uh, kind of spread. I hate to use that because it feels like you know, you've kind of put people into these buckets and I've got a lot of people who are like, oh, no, 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 that does not describe me. But I tend to see a sort of general pattern there across the board. Um, but also it's like I have, you know, I teach undergraduates and I have some undergrads who, you know, you would think these 18, 19 year old kids, like texting would be all the rage. They're calling me up on the phone and I'm like, are you kidding me? Seriously? Like, don't you know how to use text? But, you know, something about actually having a conversation is what works for them. So I think be open to it. When I'm really trying to build a relationship with somebody, I try to figure that out when I've met with them. So I might even ask in the conversation, like, hey, Mercy, I'd love to you know, follow up or continue our conversation from tonight. What's the best way to get in touch with you? And as she hands me her card, she might say, phones, you know, here's my phone and my email, but you know, I really prefer phone. And don't be afraid to let people know that because it'll make it easier for them to connect with you. Or if you do follow up with somebody by email and you're not sure, you know, ask as part of the email, like, hey, I'd love to you know, continue our conversation. Is email the best way to do that? Or do you want to set up a time to talk on the phone? Or do you want to get together live and in person? You know, real face to face. So figure out, you know, what kind of works best for the other person. So that's my recommendation for that. Um, I tend to gravitate towards email because I tend to do a lot of communication stuff at very odd hours. Imagine, you know, sleeping is not something I spend a lot of time doing. I don't know if you gathered that from the bio. Um, you know, so I, t I t write a lot of emails very early in the morning before 
people would probably welcome a phone call. So I use that, but you know, I try to always say, hey, if you, you, know, if you have some time and you wanna talk by phone, here are good times to call me, or here's a time when we might connect by phone. So you know, let them know you're open and available to other opportunities. Okay, I know there was at least one other question floating around out there, unless I scared them off. <laughs> okay, well, I will stay and answer more questions as people have them. I know sometimes people want to just grab me individually, and I'm happy to do that. So thank you. And, oh, awesome. Yes. Raffle. Thank you. Yes. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Wasn't that wonderful? That was great.